I am red-faced partly because OU got lost on the way to Houston over the weekend, and they had to call the Dallas Cowboys in at the last minute to play, and Houston beat them by 10 points. <laughs> but mostly I'm red-faced because I went to the lake yesterday, and halfway across the lake I turned to Christopher and said, I forgot my hat. It's laying on the back seat of the pickup. And so here I am. I am sunburned in places I didn't know my head had places. And so, yes, I am in pain. But I just thought I would let you know that. The, uh, Lynette and I live in a two-story house. And the upstairs loft in my house is pretty much the domain of my sons. Uh, they're all now nearly 30 years old and keep coming back home to live there. And so we just let them live in the upstairs. They grew up there. Uh, they decorated it, or at least they helped my wife decorate it, and we just kind of left it there that way. Uh, that's why we still have posters on our wall of 15-year-old movies. Uh, I don't do a whole lot up there. As I said, I, I, that was my son's place, and besides that, you have to climb stairs to get up there, and so I don't go up there very often. But we recently decided to add air conditioning to our upstairs, and uh, the posters had to come down. And so I removed this one poster, big poster, big, you know, theater-sized poster, uh, the Santa Claus. That's how long it had been hanging up there since the Santa Claus was out. And uh, this is what I found behind the Santa Claus. <laughs> now, there's not much perspective on that to tell you how big that is, but just imagine how big one of those big theater marquee posters is, and that covered that, that just pretty close. Hard to know, basketball, uh, football, uh, I figure it was throwing a body through the wall. <laughs> but one thing is sure, whatever it was that went through that wall or went into that wall, one thing is sure, instead of owning up and telling me so that we could repair the wall, they just stuck a Band-Aid on it to cover it up. In an online interview with... Uh, serious radio DJ Rude Jude Angelini talking about his life he got to talking about his love life and he said that whole thing like I'm going through a breakup I don't know what to do to make myself feel better like I, I don't know what to do to make that ache go away I don't know what to do to make that thing in my stomach go away so it's just like okay let me try this okay let me try that Sex, drugs, that's the Band-Aid. It's like you putting Band-Aids on bullet wounds. It never heals. You're just trying to fill the void. Cosmetic changes, trying to plaster over the problem, trying to whitewash it, trying to dull the pain without really dealing with the things that are causing the problem, causing the pain in the first place. A woman named Catherine writes on the blog, Waterlogged Widow. When your heart has been shattered into a billion pieces and your world that was once spinning in the right direction now seems to be a barrel rolling out of control and in multiple directions, you'll do anything you can to try to make it stop, to dull the pain, and to try to create some sense of normalcy and comfort by whatever means necessary. You cling to the tiniest fragment of anything, hoping it will make the intense and agonizing pain taking over your body stop, but it can't. It never will. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound and expecting it to heal. The only way to heal truly from a pain like this is to rip the Band-Aid away and let yourself bleed out. Ezekiel confronts the false prophets of his time. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are now prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets, Israel, are like jackals among ruins. You have not gone up to the breaches of the wall to repair it for the people of Israel so that it will stand firm in battle on the day of the Lord. 
Their visions are false and their divinations a lie. Even though the Lord has not sent them, they say, the Lord declares and expect him to fulfill their words. What they've done, says the Lord, is, is paint a coat of whitewash over the problems of Israel. On the outside, the wall looks like a wall should, straight, tall, strong, but there is nothing on it except this little thin coat of plaster, this little thin coat that holds everything together. You, you've dabbed some in the holes to kind of smooth it over. You've painted over the cracks so that they won't show. Because they lead my people astray, saying peace when there is no peace, and because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash, therefore tell those who cover it with whitewash that it's going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will send hailstones hurtling down, and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, will people not ask you, where is the whitewash you covered it with? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In my wrath, I will unleash a violent wind. In my anger, hailstones and torrents of rain will fall with destructive fury. I will tear down the wall you've covered with whitewash and will level it to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you'll be destroyed in it and you will know that I am the Lord. Here are these prophets and people come to them desperately needing to hear a word from the Lord, whether they know it or not. They're, they're looking for something. What do we do about this? Because our society is just in complete disarray. We, things are just going so terrible. But remember, this is not a bunch of people who are well-intentioned, who want to do the right thing and are really seeking a word from the Lord. Their world is big. They're confused. It's threatening. What do we do? Now, with people who are well-intentioned, you can offer them reassurance. You can say, you know, the Lord is there. The Lord is on our side. The Lord is going to be doing some great things, and, and we may need to sort some things out, and we need to fix some things, but, but things are going to be okay. But these people are rebels against the Lord. They are full of greed and hypocrisy, and they wallow in their filth. And they're not looking to these prophets to give them a real word from the Lord, but they're looking for these prophets to tell them they're okay and that they're right and that they're whole. They want reassurances that God is powerful and that he's going to save them, all right. But they don't want to change anything about their behavior. The very behaviors that are, that are ruining their lives, that are tearing them apart in the first place. See how each of the princes of Israel who are in you uses his power to shed blood. In you they have treated father and mother with contempt. In you they have oppressed the foreigner and mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and desecrated my Sabbaths. In you are slanderers who have been on shedding blood. In you are those who eat at the mountain shrines and commit lewd acts. In you are those who dishonor their father's bed. In you are those who violate women during their period when they are ceremonially unclean. In you, one man commits a detestable offense with his neighbor's wife. Another shamefully defiles his father, a daughter-in-law. Another violates his sister, his own father's daughter. In you are people who accept bribes to shed blood. You take interest and make a profit from the poor. You extort unjust gain from your neighbors, and you've forgotten me declares the sovereign Lord. Horrible, terrible, detestable things these people are doing. And yet they're looking for assurance that the Lord is going to protect them and deliver them from their enemies. The prophets give it to them. I mean, there are visions of how the Lord swoops down to destroy invading armies and how the Lord flexes his powerful arm to kill the Babylonians and how the Lord breathes fire and consumes the attacking armies. You have not gone up to the breaches in the wall to repair it for the people of Israel so that it will stand firm in battle on the day of the Lord. When a flimsy, uh, flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash, God says. Now, with those things in mind, I want you to think about a couple of things this morning, two ideas. First of all, I want you to consider how important the word of the Lord actually is in guiding us to deal with the real problems that are tearing up our lives rather than just putting a Band-Aid on bullet wounds. And secondly, I want you to think about repentance. 
maybe maybe think about repentance in a little bit different way than you have before i actually we're probably going to get to this next week because you don't want to stay here all day and let listen to me talk about repentance but we usually talk about repentance in terms of sin and being ashamed of ourselves but i want you to see how repentance is a lot more than that that repentance is a complete reorientation away from the destructive and harmful ways we have of living our lives and instead turning toward god and toward his true healing but first i want to focus on this idea of the word of the lord i don't think most of us have any problem knowing that the word of the lord is central that it's vital that it's healing that it is necessary for real life I, most of us understand we need to hear the word and we need to obey it and we can't twist it to make it say what we would like for it to say we have to accept the word for what it is it's the lord's word we have to hear the word as it is without changing it we have to obey the word and what it says without ignoring it here are these prophets in ezekiel 13 if the word of the lord doesn't say what they wanted it to say or what they would like for it to say they just make something up if they don't hear what they want to hear they invent a vision woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing even though the lord has not sent them they say the lord declares and look at this last phrase and they expect him to fulfill their words now, I don't hear that they are a lot different from some people I know who say, well, I think, and then we just expect God to do exactly what we think rather than what God says he will do. God is not somebody you get to make up out of your head. God is who he is. God is, just like you are who you are, but God is who he is, and he does not become something different just because you say, well, I just don't think that's the way God is. If we're not basing our understanding of God on how God has told us about himself, if we're not basing our understanding of who God is according to the word of God as he speaks it, we can't make God different from that just by saying it. It is to be, well, and, and God's word then, it does not become what you would like for it to be either. It is what it is. It is the word of God, this real God who exists it does not say something different simply because you want it to it is to be accepted as god spoke it as he intended it and we must conform to it and not try to make it conform to us uh, jesus says something that having read this passage in ezekiel is probably pretty familiar i bet you thought of this as he talked about destroying the whitewashed wall you probably thought of this this statement by jesus in matthew 7 verse 21 not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven many will say to me on that day lord lord did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles then i will tell them plainly i never knew you away from me you evil doers therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock the rain came uh, the rain came down the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand how deep how deep where am i here we are how deep are you into the word of god proverbs 2 says apparently i got some things out of order here sorry about that it's one of those it's kind of my life this week a little bit out of order my son if you accept my words and store up my commands within you turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding indeed if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure then you will understand the fear of the lord and find the knowledge of god now, there's a lot more about the word of god and about listening and hearing and obeying the word of god than i can say this morning but i think there are three things that are vital here about the word of the lord that we need to be aware of and be thinking about and the first one is consistency how consistent are you with the word of god 
the people in Proverbs say, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you. The, the Hebrew word, going back to this, the Hebrew word store up means hide. But, but I think the idea of store up is right because the idea behind this proverb is you store things up so that you can bring them out and use them later. We tend to use our Bibles like fire extinguishers. You know, we get in trouble, we rip it off the wall and we spray it on the fire and put out the fire and then we put it back on the wall and we go about our business. But I have noticed something about fire extinguishers around here. There's a whole bunch of fire extinguishers in this building and every once in a while, some guy will come through and he will inspect our fire extinguishers. And I found out that if fire extinguishers sit there too long, they lose their charge and they don't work. And so every once in a while, somebody goes through the building and inspects them to make sure they're up to date. And if they aren't, then this guy takes them out and he refills them and brings them back. And there they sit now, charged and ready to use. Now, the Bible is like that. If we don't have the Word of God in us already, it isn't there to speak to us when we need it. If we aren't consistently listening to God, hearing His Word and storing it up, we don't have the resources we need to handle the problems that jump on us. And so let me encourage you to get into the Bible regularly, daily if possible at least weekly. Uh, God always in his creation, ever since the beginning of the world, has set up at least a weekly gathering so that his people get together, even when they couldn't read it, they could hear it, and they get together and they worship and they hear the word of God proclaimed. And the first church, full of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, got together every day. That was the point of this passage. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, they continue to meet in the temple courts every day. It is important to regularly be in the Word of God and to be storing that Word of God up in our hearts. Secondly, do you understand what you're reading? God says, turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. You know, living the Word of God takes real Bible study. Yeah, I know. Everybody just shuddered when I said that word, you know, study. Oh, you mean like go to math class and learn how to do math? Oh, you mean study like getting ready to take a test in history? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. And I know everybody hates to do that. If it isn't transparent, if it isn't, if I can't get a hold of it with a sound bite, if, if you can't explain to me in 10 words or less, then I'm really not interested in that. Moses is dead. God has called Joshua to be his replacement. And God says to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And there's that word, meditate. Literally in Hebrew, the word means mutter. Uh, you pass Joshua on the street, and Joshua is murmuring to himself. And you think, oh, bless Joshua's heart. He's talking to himself. But what he is doing is going over and over the Word of God, over and over, turning it over and over so that he knows what it means and he knows how it applies in the situations that he finds himself in. Do you know what faith means and how it works? Do you know why Joel Osteen's definition of faith is unbiblical? Do you know what the biblical definition of faith really actually is? Do you know what resources God offers you when your mate dies? Do you know where to look when you're betrayed by a friend? We could just keep on listing things if we wanted to, but if you haven't studied, if you haven't meditated, if you haven't dug deep into the Word of God and actually learned it beyond just being words on a page, then when you need it, it isn't going to be there. 
It is something we have to learn, something we have to think about, something we have to meditate on and understand the Word of God. Thirdly, how honest are you when you hear? God says if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, are you willing for the Word of God to change you? Are you willing for the Word of God to judge you to turn you inside out and expose all those things that you want to keep hidden. The writer in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes to him, of him to whom we must give account. And what the writer is saying is that word of God tends to get right down into the crevices of where you live. And it starts digging around in there and it digs out stuff that you never even remembered about yourself. It throws the bright light of day on a lot of thoughts that you would have rather have kept hidden. It throws throws the light of, of day on attitudes that you would rather not people know about because you are slightly ashamed of those things. When I insist I am not that way, the Word of God says, ah, yes, you are. When I shout, I believe this, the Word of God says, really? You can't hide. You can't play games. You can't lie. The Word of God has its way of just laying you wide open, digging out the marrow, you know, the most inmost part of those bones. That's the hardest part to get at. Ripping that stuff out and laying it out on the table naked before the eyes of God and before your own eyes. That's exhausting, I know. You know, and I, I, I'm like you. I would love to be told how good and clean and right I am all the time. But honestly, if, if, if it's working for you and everything is going well, who needs instruction about that? But when I'm hurting, when I'm confused, when I'm destroying myself and I can't even figure out what's going wrong, that's when I need someone to be honest with me. And that's when I need to be honest with myself, within myself, and from the God who loves me, honesty. The people of Judah in Ezekiel's day didn't want to hear honest words. They wanted somebody just to tell them what they, what they wanted to hear. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. One of the blessings of being in Jesus, one of the blessings of being indwelled by the Holy Spirit is to be able to hear the Word of God clearly. Paul will say, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that comes from God, the Spirit, I'm sorry, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Now, let me unpack that a little bit, because Paul does not actually say the person without the Spirit. That is a real expanded interpretational translation of that. He says the natural man, and what he means by that is the person who sees things only from the eyes of the world, the person who looks from the perspective of this sinful world and, and, and greed and selfish and dishonesty and power. Those are the things that he understands. Those are the things he works with. And so the natural man has no clue about what God is talking about because The Spirit of God now is talking about things like self-sacrifice. And and the natural person says, self-sacrifice? Well, that just seems seems like you're trying to let people take advantage of you. Service? They don't get anywhere by serving people. You get places by using people and, and, and ruling people. You guys are just chumps. And when Paul's what Paul is talking about is the stuff revealed to us in the Word. He said a little bit earlier, Here's what's written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. The things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. And he's talking about, he's not talking about heaven, he's talking about the word of God, this word that God has given us to live by. And these natural people, these people who judge ideas only by the standards of a sinful world, they just reject God's word as silliness. It's meaningless to them. 
But we, we who are spiritual, who judge things from the perspective of God, who know that he is telling the truth, we live by that word, trusting it as we trust the one who speaks it, accepting it as the word of one who knows what he's talking about, obeying it as the will of someone who loves us with all their heart. God loves us too much to put band-aids on bullet wounds. You read through Ezekiel and you think, wow, God is just mean. And there are places in Ezekiel where you find God just standing there panting out of breath because he has destroyed so much and so many that he just is out of completely out of strength. He's exhausted. But it's not because he is purely angry and it is not because he's purely mean. It is because he cares about these people and he refuses, he refuses to let them cover over, plaster over their sins with just simply cosmetic changes. That is God's blessing to us as he confronts us in the word of God, as he speaks to us in the word of God, as he forms us and molds us and shapes us by this word. And that's the word of Christ that has been spoken to us. We're going to sing the invitation song this morning, and if you need to respond in obedience to the Lord Jesus, to give your life to him as a disciple, would you come while we're singing? Let's stand, please, and let's sing.